Fuji announced two new medium format mirrorless cameras, the GFX 50R rangefile style camera with 50 megapixels and the GFX 100S, a DSLR style mirrorless camera with 100 megapixels. I'm going to tease this. I'm going to come right back to it. First, if you want to win a Fuji X-T3, Canon EOS R, head to freesdp.com and you can win one. Also subscribe to see our upcoming review of the Fuji X-T3 there, the Nikon Z7 versus the Canon EOS M, and the Mavic 2 drone. All those are planned. Let's talk about the GFX 50R first. This is coming out in late November, so it'll be available soon. This is a medium format camera and it's $4,500. That's a really, really low price point. That's a pretty amazing sensor for 4,500 bucks. This is a rangefinder style. And what that means is, well, DSLR style like the X-H1 here. See, it's got that viewfinder right in the middle. Rangefinder styles like this old film camera. I can hold it up to my eye like this. And you see, it doesn't hit my nose. And that's why I love the rangefinder style sort of like the Sony a6300 series cameras have that. And right now I know a lot of people are complaining that they're left-eyed and thus when they use a rangefinder, it gets really awkward on their face because it has to like, so it's not for left-eyed people. <laughs> but if you love rangefinder cameras, you probably already know it. If you like the viewfinder in the middle, this is not gonna be the camera for you. But if you're a rangefinder person, you're probably very excited and I think most of the people buying the GFX 50R are going to have a natural affection for rangefinders. So look at where the rangefinder is. This is key to appreciating the camera. Other elements of it are very Fuji. The buttons are kind of flat. The thumbstick is kind of small. You can see it as a uh, two-way tilting screen on there. As far as the features go, it has contrast focusing only. It does not have phase detect autofocus, so it is essentially the same camera as the existing GFX 50S, their more expensive SLR style camera. And that can be kind of frustrating. Like nobody is a fan of the focusing of the GFX 50S and that limits its usefulness some. You're never gonna shoot sports with it. Even as a portrait camera, it can be very difficult to nail the focus on an eye if you have any kind of shallow depth of field. The wider portraits are gonna be just fine. But for landscapes, for commercial work, for product photography, this can be great if you're a person who can manually focus and do it accurately, that's great. The frames per second is three frames per second. So again, it's not gonna be a sports camera. That's slow, but it is about the pace that you take. The raw files are 14 bit and it should have about 14 stops of dynamic range and they've added Bluetooth. That's something that the 50S doesn't have, but that the other latest Fuji cameras do. Just helps in facilitating transferring pictures to your camera. We have already reviewed the sensor that's in this camera and you can check out that review here. It's also in the Hasselblad X1D camera. And it was not great news. The sensor is excellent. It's 50 megapixels. The challenge with it is, if you're gonna compare a 50 megapixel camera to something, you're probably gonna compare it to full frame cameras. And full frame 50 megapixel sensors, ballpark 50 megapixel, they're pretty amazing. They're updated a little more frequently. The sensor's already a little bit old and they have a lot more lens options. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. The tilting screen is a two-way tilting screen, which is a little unusual for Fuji. Fuji's latest cameras have all had a three-way tilting screen. The three-way tilting screen is a little bit of a benefit because you can turn the camera into a portrait vertical orientation and continue to shoot with it. So on the G, the X-H1 here, you can see I could hold it over my head and shoot over a crowd while still looking at the screen like that, or I could hold it down low to the ground with the screen tilted out. It does not have that. It only tilts up and down. Um, it's also a touchscreen that seems to work pretty well, and that's in a modern workflow that can be really useful. The GFX 50R is weatherproof. That's something that Fuji takes a lot of pride in. They like to show that their cameras can get a little bit soaked, and if you are a pro shooter, there are times when it starts to rain and you still have to shoot. This is particularly important for the range file style, style camera because this is small and compact. Some people are calling it pocketable because apparently they have massive giant pockets. I do not, but nonetheless, it is a camera that I would love to take on a hike or something and you never know when you're gonna get surprised that weatherproofing can be important. Two SD cards, 
good. We don't have to have a fit about that this time. The sync speed for those of us who shoot in the studio is 1 1 25th of a second. That's not great. That's actually really, really slow. Most cameras will sync at uh, 1 250th of a second. My D850 will actually do it at 1 3 20th of a second in practice. Uh, above that, you have to go into high speed sync. And that's okay. Our studio lights do HSS, so it wouldn't slow us down at all. And 1 1 25th is not bad. You want a faster sync speed, mostly because it helps you to kill the ambient light in the room. So if you're shooting outdoors uh, in full sun, or even in a well-lit studio, like a lot of us shoot in, um, the slower sync speeds mean if you're not using high-speed sync, then it's it's harder to kill all the ambient light in the photo, and you have to turn the the strobes up brighter in order to get rid of that ambient light. It has USB-C, and for the first time, it actually will synchronize. It'll tether to Capture One. So those of you who use a Capture One workflow, yay, you can finally use your Fuji camera. That's been a challenge because Capture One hasn't wanted to support medium format cameras other than their own Phase One camera series. This is not a video camera. It has 1080 video and no headphone jack. So that's okay, but it just, it doesn't have to be that. Uh, they, Fuji has also announced three new lenses. These are medium format lenses. So these are not 35 millimeter equivalent. These are literal, um, the 50 millimeter F3.5 pancake for people who do want to just something they can carry around and carry around a medium format camera. That's cool. A 45 to 100 F4 zoom and a 100 to 200 millimeter with image stabilization. Good. That's important because the camera itself does not have a stabilized sensor. And with 50 megapixels, it's really hard to eliminate any kind of camera shake without any kind of stabilization. That's one of my biggest gripes about these systems. Let's talk about what it means when you say medium format for this camera specifically, because the term medium format, I think, is overused. In the film days, when this term first started getting used, the medium format film often had uh, a size that would be like three or four times bigger than 35 millimeter film. That's not the case with this. The medium format sensors in these cameras are slightly bigger than full frame cameras. And medium format, technically, we use it to refer to anything bigger than full frame, but the difference is not that much. So they might be pulling the marketing a little bit harder than they should be. The crop factor here, because it's bigger than 35 millimeters, is less than one. So it has a 0.79 times crop factor. For the surface area, the surface area is about 1.7 times bigger than full frame sensors. That's good. That's bigger. But if you were to go from, say, APS-C to full frame, that's a 2.25 times improvement in sensor size. So the jump you would see going from full frame to this is much smaller than the jump you see from going from APS-C to full frame. However, if you are cropping to 8x10, this has a more square aspect ratio. So less gets cropped off when you print an 8x10. Thus, your surface area here is 1.9 times bigger when you have to crop off because 35 millimeter film has that like 2 by 3 aspect ratio. However, if you are planning to print in two by three formats anyway, like a 20 by 30 size print, the surface area advantage goes down to 1.5 times bigger. So just a 50% improvement. So you can see the surface size of the sensor isn't that much, but it's gonna depend on your final printing. So if you are an artist and you already know that you like that eight by 10 aspect ratio, or you wanna print in the normal native aspect ratio, then the advantage is gonna be bigger than you can see there. Uh, I do feel like they push the medium format marketing a little bit. Um, some of it could even be misleading. Here's a quote from Fuji. A medium format sensor creates greater depth of field for shallow field subjects. And medium format sensors can create de greater depth of field if you keep the f-stop number constant. The challenge here is that the available real world medium format lenses are not equivalent faster than the 35 millimeter lenses that we see. So let's look at the actual GFX lenses. Here's a list of most of the lenses, not all of them. And you can see these prime lenses, their 35 millimeter equivalents on the right here are at an equivalent F32 or F22, or even the portrait lens here is an equivalent to basically an 85 millimeter f1.6. In the 35 millimeter world, you'd usually be using f2 or f1.4 at these focal lengths, and the lenses would be cheaper. And for an 85 millimeter portrait lens, the standard is really 85 millimeter f1.4. 
though a lot of people will use uh, an 85 millimeter f1.2. So the available common 35 millimeter lenses are actually faster and will thus give you shallower depth of field and even better low light gathering capability. Their uh, normal zoom lens here is equivalent to a 25 to 50 millimeter f3.2. And lately we've been testing the Canon full frame EOS R 28 to 70 millimeter f2. So that's more than a stop faster, even in the equivalent terms. So the idea that the medium format cameras produce shallower depth of field, more background blur, just doesn't hold up in the real world. And yeah, my dog is freaking out. <laughs> okay, let's look at the prices too. Um, at the top here, we have Fuji's 85 millimeter F1.6 portrait equivalent. It costs $2,200, but you can see in the 35 millimeter world, these lenses are all significantly less expensive. So, um, well, real quickly, a comparison to the A7R 3 and D850, you can expect in ideal conditions to get similar image quality. Uh, technically, you might get a little bit better dynamic range out of it, except the D850 supports a very low ISO of ISO 64, and the A7R 3 supports a pixel shift that will stack multiple images. So in practice, you would see similar or perhaps even better dynamic range uh, and and um, the amount of noise and color that you might get out of optimal conditions because they just have that little bump in technology there. Uh, and at high ISOs, because the available lenses are faster, you'll generally get better image quality out of the full frame cameras. The focusing system on the GFX series cameras is going to be worse than any camera with phase detect autofocus because the technology just isn't there yet. These aren't action cameras at all. The lenses are fewer and slower. There are no IBIS on these cameras and they don't support 4K video. So once you start to compare it to the full frame cameras, you begin to wonder like, okay, what are the advantages? There are some. <clears throat> History. I personally have always lusted over what we call the Texas Leica, these old Fuji medium format rangefinder cameras. That's just what I always wanted when I was shooting film. I could never afford it. And then by the time I could afford it, film was kind of gone. And now it seems like a lot of work to go back to shooting medium format film. You might also be passionate about either Fuji themselves or the rangefinder format. Photography is an art form. It doesn't have to be about megapixels and uh, depth of field and equivalency and all this. You can just love the experience of it, right? If you pick up this camera and you feel passionate about it and you want to go shoot, then that has value. And I know it's still a lot of money. It's not necessarily a good value, but $4,500 for a camera body, to some people that's more than they could ever afford. But I know people who will spend $100,000 on a car just for fun. To them, it's not a big deal. So there are people out there who will be like, oh, you know what? This would actually make me go take some pictures because this looks cool. Go for it. Those people should have it. And sometimes people want a medium format camera because it's unusual, because it's prestigious. Cameras do sometimes project things about us to other people. And photography has for a long time been about the image. So I'm not saying that these are reasons that you should go buy it, but these are reasons that other people will go buy it that aren't going to make sense to my left brain nerds out there who want to make everything about numbers. Now let's talk about the 100 megapixel GFX 100S that Fuji is announcing the development of. This one's not as far along. It has sensor stabilization. It has phase detect autofocus and it has 4K 30 video at 10 bits. It's like they just Oh, let's just give him Tony everything he wants. This sounds fantastic. I'm really excited about this because it's hundred megapixels right away. It's going to probably pull more detail out of whatever lenses that, that they attach to it. It's announced for release sometime in 2019. So we're still very vague about here about this, but you can see the camera itself looks fairly beautiful. I love the design of it. It's an SLR style design. It has that vertical grip built into it, much like say the top end Nikon and Canon cameras. Uh, the price is going to be about $10,000. So $10,000, but that's still really inexpensive compared to like the Mamiya or phase one cameras that you would have to be using if you wanted to reach 100 megapixels. So that's actually not bad. We're super excited to see this. It's going to be something 
unique. You're going to be able to get more detailed and more rich pictures than you could with any other camera, and we can't wait to see it. Why aren't I complaining about the flippy screen like I just did on my Panasonic uh, S1 videos? Well, because Panasonic is known for having flippy screens. We've long loved the flippy screens on the GH5, and that is why so many people bought into the Panasonic system was they offered these unique video capabilities with a flippy screen. I know not everybody wants a flippy screen. On these cameras, I wouldn't care about the flippy screen. It wouldn't be bad. I don't think it's a detriment, but at the same time, it doesn't match the style and uh, I don't imagine these using being people using these for video. Once again, go to freestp.com to win yourself an X-T3 and subscribe to see our upcoming reviews. Thank you very much. And if I made any mistakes, add a comment down below. I'll add a pinned comment that summarizes any changes that I might have. And if you have follow-up questions or things you want to see in the full review, write a comment. Bye.